Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 10th episode of The Wild World of Bees. I'm Lincoln Best. I'm uh, the taxonomist for the Oregon Bee Atlas, and I'll be your host this evening. The Wild World of Bees is an online lecture series you can enjoy from the comfort of home. Through this series, we'll hear from great bee researchers and native bee advocates from around North America and the world. Often, we'll have a focus closer to us here in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. And this month, I'm our guest, and I'm in Corvallis. This series is brought to you by the Oregon Bee Atlas, a citizen science-based initiative to document the incredibly rich bee fauna and its floral relations in the state of Oregon. The Bee Atlas is the biodiversity-focused arm of a, the Greater Oregon Bee Project, and that is a partnership between OSU Extension, the Oregon Department of Forestry, and the Oregon Department of Agriculture. The Oregon Bee Project is dedicated to pollinator health in the state. This series is sponsored by the Mount Pisgah Arboretum in Eugene, Oregon, by the USDA NEFA Pollinator Health Grant, and by the Native Bee Society of British Columbia. You can visit their website, bcnativebees.org, to learn more about their fauna, flora, and local initiatives. Now, in our last episode, I had the pleasure of hosting Colleen Satisher from the University of Minnesota, and she introduced us to the Minnesota Bee Atlas, another state bee atlas, and to their cavity nesting bees and her research on those cavity nesters. You can find her talk on our Oregon Bee Atlas YouTube channel. And you can also find all of our older episodes of the Wild World Bees and other educational content on our YouTube channel. So please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. So of course, this evening I'm the host and the guest and I will um, be presenting on the bumblebees of the Oregon Bee Atlas. So we're in our, what, third cycle of the Bee Atlas, meaning we've had people out in the field collecting native bees all over the state for three seasons. And so now we have more and more data um, accumulating, particularly in this case on the bumblebees. Now, in previous episodes of this webinar, um, I took some liberties with um, my introductions of the guests. And so I'll do the same thing to myself just for the, just to make sure it's fair. And so I'm Lincoln Bess, I'm the taxonomist for the Bee Atlas and for the Master Melatologist programs here at Oregon State. Um, I'm a Canadian and I developed an obsession with natural history at a young age. And I'm very fortunate my, that my parents supported that. And I pinned and labeled my first bumblebee, a Bombus furbitus, in 1987. And I expanded my interest in aculeates, which are the stinging insects, when I was an undergraduate. Now, I'm fortunate to have traveled around the world studying native bees and have documented bumblebees specifically from pine oak mountaintops in northwestern Thailand to windswept peaks in the Pamir Ally of Central Asia at something around like 5,000 meters in elevation. Um, I would describe my professional life as independent and unconventional. Um, for those uh, that know me, you know I host a lot of bee courses all over the place, um, but certainly not all of you have been treated to the uh, bumblebee blow drying in a tuxedo lectures. And I should mention also that I've spent some great years working in the ecologics lab at the University of Calgary in Alberta. So currently, of course, I find myself working with a great team that includes Adoni Malathopoulos, Sarah Kincaid, and Jen Holt. And we're in the Faculty of Horticulture here at OSU. And also, I'm, I'm really fortunate to be working and collaborating with what feels like dozens of people um, in Oregon um, at OSU and further abroad around the state on all sorts of research related to native bees. And it's, it's super exciting. So of course, if you have any questions, um, you know, maybe put them into the Q and A box that you can find at the bottom of your screen and we'll 
moderate a, a Q&A session um, after the lecture. So of course, I'm helping to run the Oregon Bee Atlas. And as we know, it is um, the biodiversity focused arm of the greater Oregon Bee Project. And so that would be, the Atlas would be this native bee survey here. Now, um, as part of uh, sort of organic program growth, and also in response to the current um, situation, um, we have developed the Master Melatologist program. And so because of all of our awesome, exciting events last year were canceled, um, we developed online um, training and educational modules, um, which together are forming the first step in becoming a Master Melatologist. The program itself is similar to other master type programs. For example, um, a lot of people know about master gardeners, but there's also master naturalists and master beekeepers. And so this program is about um, native bees. And so a melatologist is specifically someone that studies um, the biodiversity of non honeybees or native bees. Um, for those of you who are already master melatologist apprentices, ignore the dates that are on the slide. Don't panic about it. Um, and what you find is the program itself is made up of um, in-person in events, online training, various courses that you can attend. So field courses. We had a field course last year in the Siskiyous, which was super fun. Um, and that's where this photo here is taken from. People call it B camp. But we're just running around in like this just amazing um, internationally significant botanical area where there's just incredible biodiversity just everywhere. Um, and of course, we host um, in-person laboratory courses um, where you get to sit at a microscope all day and look at different bees and, and learn more of the finer details about um, their morphology and taxonomy. So as I mentioned, after a couple seasons now of our master melatologists running around um, through the back backwoods of Oregon and uh, collecting and surveying native bees, we have generated quite a bit of data. And so in orange are the 2018 data points for the different bees that have been collected and in yellow is the 2019 data. And of course we have even more 2020 data now, which is not um, projected in this image. For those, I, we saw it earlier that there, we have mostly people from Oregon, but for those people that are out of state, I'm going to take a couple minutes just to familiarize you a little bit with the um, broad eco regions of the state. And after that, we're going to look at, um, well, I should say, the way that this talk is set up is kind of like a field guide. And so I will introduce the um, 22 or so bumblebee species um, that we've detected and documented through the Oregon Bee Atlas over the last couple of years. I'll provide you some with some basic natural history notes, um, some basic notes on their identification, um, and then we'll look at the, the a map of this type which um, shows where our master melatologists have documented all these different bumblebee species in the state. And we'll, we'll, I'll discuss briefly some of the trends in their distributions. And so let's do that. So Oregon has a, around nine or 10 ecoregions. There's a couple different active classification schemes, but this is what's considered level three um, for our state um, ecoregion classification system. So in blue here, we have the coast. It's wet and temperate. Here, we have the Willamette Valley. And this is a grassland oak savanna, primarily. In green here, we have the Klamath Mountains. The Klamath Mountains are very diverse. We'll say that, um, a mix of mountain habitats, um, arid grasslands, um, and some really extreme uh, local ecosystem types. Um, here in this kind of aquamarine color, we have the Cascade Mountains. 
In brown, adjacent that, we have these eastern slopes and the foothills of the Cascades. Here on the south side of the Columbia River, we have the Columbia Plateau. These various shades of green are the Blue Mountains. And so we have the Wallawas in the northeast extending down through the, the John Day and parts of the Deschutes in the southwest. Here we have um, the Snake River Plains, which is really lower elevation and quite hot and dry. And then of course here we have the Northern Basin and Range. And this is the greater extent of what we consider the high desert, which is very dry, um, hot summers and more cool winters than you'll find on the coast. Now, that's a lot of different ecoregions, but to, to, to summarize it even further, we have two mountain ranges in the west. The west half of the state is quite um, temperate and wet. In the east half of the state, um, the temperature profile is more extreme on both ends and is quite a bit drier, generally. So often what we're going to see looking at these bumblebee distributions are, you know, Bumblebees that like temperate wet weather will be found on the, on the west side of the state and things that like it more dry will be found on the east. Um, and so let's take a look at our first example. This is Bombus appositus or the white-shouldered bumblebee. One interesting thing about Bombus appositus in the state is that we have two forms. This form that has actual, the, this form of the white-shouldered bumblebee, which has yellow shoulders. Um, is actually found only in the Willamette Valley. So that's kind of cool that we have our own um, unique co color morph um, restricted to the Willamette Valley. Otherwise, um, the white-shouldered bumblebee has white shoulders and all of its turga, um, all five of its turga, these, these things are the turga um, or turgites, all of them are yellow. So it's a very yellow bumblebee with a, a black band across its wing base and white shoulders. So this is the data we've collected through the Oregon Bee Atlas. In red is data from 2018, and in blue is data from 2019. And this, um, that'll be true for all of these maps. So on all the maps, red, red dots will be data from 2018, and blue dots will be data from 2019. So just off the bat, what do we see with respect to the distribution of um, Bombus appositus in the state, um, we find that it's not particularly abundant in our samples. You know, maybe there's 50 dots here. Um, we find that the dots are primarily restricted to lower elevation grassland type ecosystems. Um, so in the Columbia Valley, in the Willamette Valley primarily is where most of our occurrence data is from. And then in the areas around the Wallawas, which are quite arid and, um, and warm and lots of grasslands. And then of course we have um, several occurrences on the steens. So just to refresh your memory for this map one more time, we have um, the west half of the state is more temperate and wet and the east half of the state is drier with um, greater temperature extremes generally. So here's an interesting case, and uh, I've broken this one up into three species um, in order to answer what's become kind of a common question. And that is, historically, we, we recognized this species as Bombus bifarius for any of these color morphs, or um, Bombus bifarius would be the, the most red color morph, and Bombus nearcticus would be this um, color morph here, which has just a single yellow bar and no red. And so what came to pass this past year was there was a paper published, and they took our old idea of what Bombus bifarius is, the two-toned bumblebee, and they separated it into two species, one of which has two subspecies. And they did that using um, genetic analysis, using CO1 data and uh, whole genome data as well. And so generally, the outcome was that um, in 
in the area of the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea in Southern Vancouver Island and adjacent areas, we have a, um, a unique species. So the, the genes for the species are unique just to this area. Everywhere else this bumblebee occurs, which is millions and millions of square kilometers, we find that use, looking at the genetics that there's two different species. And one of them is, hmm, one of them is Bombus bifarius, which is found here, mostly in the Colorado Plateau. And the other one is the sister species to this Vancouverensis. And so the three species that exist now are Bombus Vancouverensis, Vancouverensis, Bombus Vancouverensis nearcticus, which is this one that just um, has no red or very little red, and then Bombus bifarius in the strict sense, which just is found mostly around the Colorado Plateau. And so everyone wants to know, well, which one is it in our area now? So if you're in Vancouver, probably it's Vancouverensis. In Oregon, it's likely Bombus Vancouverensis subspecies Nearcticus is what we have based on this study. Um, and then of course, Southeast in the Colorado Plateau, they have Bombus bifarius senso stricto. Feel free to ask some questions about that at the end. So what we find in Oregon is that we have, um, this is an abundant species. Looks like it's primarily found, you know, along the crest of the Cascades eastward. Mostly, you know, this is uh, the Ochocos, um, various um, national forests. So almost all of these points are within forested areas. Um, most of these areas are dry forests, um, and it's pretty straightforward. We get a couple points on the coast. We get a couple in Vancouver or in Portland, um, but otherwise, you know, this distribution here follows that Blue Mountain ecoregion, and then of course here we kind of get the rest of the points, which is um, the Cascades and the eastern slopes of the Cascades, and that. The species fits into those two eco regions quite well. So Bombus collagenosis is a bumblebee that people have a lot of difficulties with. Um, that's because it looks almost identical to our most common bumblebee in Oregon, um, Bombus bosnicenskii. So this is a species with a yellow head, yellow shoulders, and one yellow stripe. I find the easiest way to tell the, those two species apart is to, buy, to look at the length of the cheek here. And so on this species, the cheek will be noticeably longer, <laughs> I promise. Um, and secondarily, there are some yellow hairs under its belly right here. Now, in the state, we found this um, species um, primarily west of the crest of the Cascades. And so this is in the cool, temperate, and wet part of the state, um, right along the coast, just like immediately in coastal habitats, um, and then on the uh, west side of the Willamette Valley quite a bit. Um, that's where the majority of our records come from. And a study like this is, is good um, because, because our volunteers are collecting specimens, we're able to get really, really good um, data on bombs collagenosis. And if you're taking pictures, you know, you can't definitively say um, which species this is in most cases. And so having those specimens in hand allows us to um, ensure that this data is really high quality. So Bombus centralis is a striking um, looking bumblebee that has very yellow hairs and a very dark black um, band between the wing bases, and it has two orange bands um, on its abdomen as well. This is another species that has a very um, kind of faithful distribution um, through that Blue Mountain ecoregion. 
and along the Cascades and eastern slopes of the Cascades, which a couple records in the coastal range. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that these records are from parts of the coastal range that are uh, deforested, is what my expectation is. And then we find a couple records down in the Klamath um, and a whole bunch atop the Steens. Um, but the Steens are a bit of a unique place. Um, and so you can have a lot of these different um, climates all on the Steens, separated sometimes by just hundreds of meters. Now in Oregon, we have two really distinct um, color morphs of what's considered Bombus fervidus, or the great yellow bumblebee. Um, Bombus fervidus has a really long face, um, black hairs on the head, and an almost entirely yellow body. Um, and its other color morph, which is often called Bombus californicus, um, looks very much like Bombus caliginosus, which we, we saw a minute ago. So it has yellow shoulders um, and one yellow stripe on T4. One, two, three, four. So yellow stripe on T4. But note that um, it has a, that all black head, which is really diagnostic. And even in a picture where it's flying and um, it's, it's kind of blurry, um, you can still see that uh, the head is black very distinctly. Now, most of these photos are mine, but I have noted um, for some of them where they came uh, off of iNaturalist. So thank you to Sedge Queen and others. So Bomb Bombus fervidus in Oregon um, is pretty widespread, but again, you can see um, the Blue Mountains have quite a few points. And then of course, the valley itself, specifically in the Willamette Valley here, um, we have lots of records for Bombus fervidus. Now, something that happens, and I wish I had some good photos on hand of this, but I do not. Um, something that happens is that the Californicus morph, that's mostly black, which is mostly coastal and in the valley, um, it integrates completely with that all yellow form, which is more common east of the Cascades. And so in the valley, we get all these weird looking Bombus fervidus um, that are like kind of modeled. Um, and really, they're just um, perfect integrations of that um, very black color form and that all yellow color form. And so that's something to keep your eye open for. And they can, bees like that can sometimes be a little tricky to identify, especially when you're learning. So in Oregon, we've documented so far two of the four cuckoo bumblebees. And cuckoo bumblebees are bumblebees that make their living by sneaking into the nests that are already established of other bumblebees and then usurping that nest and, and tricking the established workforce into raising the cuckoo bumblebees young. It's a great strategy. So we found two of the four species known from the state so far. And this one, which is known as Bombus flavidus in Paul Williams 2014 Bumblebee Field Guide. I'm sure that everyone has one of these. If you don't, you should get it. It's fantastic. This uh, bumblebee is historically known as Bombus fernalde, and it's not clear to me which is the preferred um, name at the moment. Um, so what we found in that Bombus bifarius uh, situation earlier was that authors using genetic data had recently split the one species into two or three. Um, what Paul did in his field guide was use the, some genetic data to lump species. So he, he took some North American bumblebees and lumped them with old world species. Some of these things are whole Arctic, maybe. Depends how fine a lens you aim at them, I suppose. Anyways, with this cuckoo bumblebee, we find that the top of its head is yellow and that it has that common color pattern of having yellow shoulders with T4 yellow as well. And thank you, Brianna, for your photo. So this is where we found uh, Bombus flavidus or Bombus fernalde in the state. Um, it's pretty distinctly on the, mostly in, on the tops and forested areas of the Cascades down into the Klamath. Um, and then uh, some of them are coastal with a smattering of other records. 
you know, we don't have tons of records for this bee. And part of the reason for that is because they're a cuckoo bee, they exist at abundances that are much lower than their host bees. And so um, if we find um, one for every 10 of the host, that's not bad, but it ends up meaning that you have far less data for that species than others. Now, if you have questions, please pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom and uh, we can cover a lot of things at the end. So Bombus flavifrons also has two common color morphs. Um, one where the abdomen is half yellow and half black and the other one where the abdomen is half yellow and half red. And so one common trend you see among bumblebees that have um, really extreme color morphs is that generally the color form is the same. And what happens is, is often the black is either replaced with yellow or it's replaced with red. And quite commonly it's replaced with red. And we'll see another example of that in a few minutes. So in the state, again, we find um, quite a distinct um, grouping um, for its distribution. Again, in the Blue Mountain region, which is um, forested areas, slightly higher elevation. Um, and then of course, from the Cascades, west from the kind of crest of the Cascades west into the temperate areas um, and forested areas, we find lots of bombus flavifrons. And it's a species um, that we find widely in North America in cool, wet habitats. And so that could be coastal habitats, but it could also be high mountain and alpine habitats as well. And so um, our, our data kind of reflects that fact of its um, habitat preferences. So Bombus griseocollis, which is also called the brown belted bumblebee because it has a, often a brown stripe on the second tergite here. It's a species that really likes fairly warm grasslands. And so we find it um, in the foothills and the bottom of the Cascades, on the east side of the Cascades here. We find it um, widespread in the Willamette Valley. We find it in the Columbia Plateau. So this is, you know, quite hot, dry grasslands through here. And then also, um, this is the Snake River, which is lower elevation, super hot. You know, it's one of those places where you could fry an egg on the hood of your car, no problem. You don't even want to get out, it's just smoldering. And then down here, um, as the Blue Mountains get lower in elevation, I'm sure there's some hot, open, dry places that they like in here. Um, so Bombus huntii is another species. Um, this one's, you know, fairly easy to identify. Um, it has a very yellow head um, and very yellow, bright yellow hairs overall with yellow, orange, orange, yellow pattern of uh, hairs on its abdomen. And this species, interestingly, we've primarily found it east of the Cascades. And really in the, the foothills of the Cascades, not, you know, just east of the summit, but dip. lower in elevation, again, in, gra in warm grasslands and kind of submontane habitats. And you can see it goes up into the Blue Mountains a bit and then through the desert, you know, we don't have very many samples from down in this black hole here, northwest of Heart Mountain around Christmas sand dunes in that area. But, um, and then we find lots of them um, around the steams. Now, I do know that they have been documented, I believe, in Eugene, and I think I saw a record from Portland. And so Bombus huntii does get into the valley. I'm sure it's more widespread in the Klamath as well, but um, this gives us a pretty good idea of where it's most abundant. So Bombus insularis is our second species of cuckoo bumblebee. This one's a bit more common. Um, they're, the females are really big and mean looking. Um, and you can see, um, you know, in these photos, you see the uh, color template from the bumblebee field guide. And then you see the, the photo of the bee on the right. And so, you know, something to keep in mind as we work through these is to see if you can match up the color patterns, see where they agree and see where they disagree. And so in this instance, this bee agrees very well except for this yellow band, this um, posterior thoracic band. Obviously in this instance, um, it's black in here and 
in the photo on uh, Facelia Hestata, it's um, quite yellow and distinct, also with a black notch in it. And so here it will be yellow and yellow. So we don't have a ton of, of data overall on cuckoo bumblebees, um, but this gives us an idea. Um, I'm sure they're much more widespread than this, but um, you know we're continuing to sample and um, we'll build these data sets up over time. So Bombus melanopygus, melano uh, means black, pygus means tail. So this is the black tailed bumblebee. Um, this is a, a common, species um, that typically has the tail black here, but often has a couple yellow hairs on the corners um, with a yellow, orange, orange, black, black color pattern on the abdomen. Um, something to notice uh, is the difference between um, bright yellow hairs and um, what they display as kind of a gray color, or uh, in this case, maybe kind of a brownish color in the field guide. And what that is there to depict is not brown hairs, um, but where there are yellow and black hairs intermixed. And so you can really see that really clearly here, how the, the hairs on the anterior thoracic band are completely intermixed and quite dark, along with the hairs of the vertex here and on the face to a degree, um, whereas the hairs on the uh, posterior thoracic band laterally are bright yellow. So you can really contrast this with this. Um, sometimes people get caught up when they're trying to identify their bumblebee. So for Bombus melanopygus, we find that primarily they're um, most abundant west of the Cascades, um, starting in the eastern slopes and, and foothills of the Cascades, west through these more temperate um, forested habitats and open habitats of the Willamette Valley all the way to the coast. And down here in the Southwest coastal region, we actually do get the Bombus edwardsi uh, color morph, which has no black, or sorry, it has no, um, has no red here. And so it's, it's black and then with a little bit of yellow here. And it can be a tricky one to identify. There we go. So that was the black-tailed bumblebee. Here's one that I really like. This is Bombus mixtus, or the fuzzy horned bumblebee. And that's because the males um, have really um, big patches of fur on their antennae. And so it makes the males of Bombus mixtus really easy to identify with a lens or a scope. Um, so this, this bee has um, quite mixed hairs, Bombus mixtus, lots of mixed colored hairs. Um, and then it has often a, um, a bright colored tail. And so here we can see that tail right here. Um, but take, take a moment to look at this photo and see if you notice anything interesting about this bumblebee. I know that um, probably a, a few of you have already figured it out and I might've passed this photo around once before, but so what are we looking for? Well, what we're looking at um, is right here. And what these are, are these are the pollinia or the pollen pouches from an, a native orchid. And so these little queens, um, these little queen bumblebees um, habitually in uh, montane habitats where this orchid grows will visit this uh, Calypso bulbosa, little fairy slipper orchid. And when it goes into the flower right here, um, it, it basically peels off these pollinia which stick to its back. And in this case, um, it actually is carrying two pairs of the pollinia. So the pollinia come in like a little, uh, a pair. And so this bumblebee's picked up two pairs. And so um, often they get tricked repeatedly. And so uh, probably in May, if you're in montane, montane areas, if you, if you see bumblebees around, you'll see those brilliant yellow packets on their back, no problem. And now you know what those are. 
And so Bombus mixtus, um, again, we find that it's in the forested and cooler um, higher elevation areas in the east through the Blue Mountains almost exclusively. You know, I'm sure they're much more widespread, but certainly this is their area of greatest abundance. And then from the crest of the Cascades westward through all these temperate forests and grasslands. Um, so Bombus mixtus is one that you can commonly find on the coast, um, but you can confuse it with Bombus sitkensis um, if you're trying to identify them to species. Bombus morrisoni is, um, or Morrison's bumblebee is, a, is such a cool critter. Um, most bumblebees around the world prefer more temperate, cool climates. Um, but Bombus morrisoni is one that has adapted to hotter climates um, in our region. And so this is a really large sized bumblebee. Um, these queens are, you know, they're the ones that look like a, a yellow bat or like some giant um, flying mouse or something. You hear them coming in the spring. Um, this, this photo does them a little credit, but this yellow is really almost neon, um, which makes them stick out from a lot of other bumblebees. That, that yellow is really, really vibrant. And you'll find that they have um, three, usually three and a half um, abdominal segments with yellow hairs. You can kind of make that out here, although this one looks like maybe less. So Bombus morrisoni is a bumblebee of, I think, of conservation concern. I'm sure it's not listed because so few things are, but this is, this is one that is not frequently encountered. And so what we found is that um, we have some records, um, you know, around Bend and, and the local area. And so we have a, a pretty, some really, really good collectors out there, um, really excellent um, bee surveyors. And so in this area where they have done pretty intensive sampling, this is where all of our data has come from. And that's because we don't have intensive sampling, say, again, around Christmas sand dunes area. And so where we have high intensity sampling in the desert, we do have some records, um, but as you can see, we don't have hundreds of records. Um, but we'll um, increase our knowledge on their um, kind of contemporary distribution over time, and hopefully we can learn more about their natural history as well. Now, Bombus morrisoni that we just saw has something of a lookalike species. So this is Bombus nevadensis, the Nevada bumblebee. It's likely our largest bee in the state, um, and it has a very similar color pattern. Um, one difference is this black dot, so it does have some black hair centrally on its thorax. And overall, this species is extremely large. Um, and the, the easy way, if you get your hands on specimens um, of both Bombus nevadensis and Bombus morrisoni, the way to tell them apart quite simply is um, by the length of the cheek. Bombus nevadensis has a very long cheek and Bombus morrisoni has quite a short cheek. Now, hopefully you weren't too close to your screen, but, um, oh, maybe 10 years ago, um, I was hiking around and I could hear this buzzing coming from in the sage. So I got down in there and I found that one of these giant Nevada bumblebee queens was stuck in a widow's web. Um, and so I photo documented it. And I can tell you that even though that bumblebee queen is like this big, she didn't stand a chance. So with respect to the data, our Oregon Bee Atlas and Astro Melatologists have um, generated for the state. Um, we see here that the Nevada bumblebee is widespread, that we don't have a, a ton of data on them. You know, we have some, but not reams. Um, and that mostly they're found um, in grasslands, in open habitats, um, and probably open forested areas. Everyone's favorite Western bumblebee is uh, Bombus occidentalis. Um, in the state, we have two common color forms. Um, the first is kind of the classic with the, the yellow shoulders and the white tail. And the second is similar, but with, um, with more yellow hairs on the, the back of the thorax. Um, they're quite easy to identify. 
people don't have too many problems and uh, it, uh, people are pretty excited when they recognize their first one. Um, so we have found some data um, through the state. Um, and keep in mind too, that all of these records um, were caught with a net um, and that, that our master melatologists recorded the floral records for each one of these observations. So we do have other data um, collected using pan traps or vein traps. Um, so we, I could probably have scrounged some more dots for the map, but as it stands, we find that um, occidentalis in the state um, is widespread. Um, it's likely most abundant um, at higher elevations in the Cascades. And I don't mean alpine, but I mean just higher up into the drier side of the forests as well. And that also we have some records from the either the Wallawa Whitman National Forest or the Umatillas, um, and then kind of on the east side of the Wallawas. Um, so they're out there. Um, we have more recent records um, from near the gorge, um, but we don't have any recent records from the coast. Um, and we have looked at a lot of bees from the coast in, uh, in some other projects as well. So just to give you an idea of um, where we're finding these in the state. Now, this is another one of those bees that has multiple color forms. And so this color form um, has a kind of a crescent of yellow. And so you can com compare uh, the photo to the, the color template and these ones match up quite well. So you see a, a bit of a crescent of yellow here um, with lots of orange and then a bit of a yellow tail. Now, you'll recall a few minutes ago, I said that often when we get bumblebees that have two or more color forms, that really is what, what happens with those color forms is that um, black is replaced either with orange or yellow. And so in this case, um, we see the orange here and nearly the identical color morph, um, it has all of the orange replaced with black. So look at that again. And then essentially orange and the black replace, replace one another. But ultimately, it makes a very different looking bee. And we can see here that this bee looks completely different from its sister in the previous photo. And so um, we say that if you're working on identifying a whole bunch of bumblebees, um, when in doubt, it's a rufosynctus because rufosynctus doesn't have just these two color forms. It actually has dozens and dozens of color forms and it has a mimic for nearly every species that you'll encounter. Interestingly, um, we don't have any distributional trends in the state. Um, I have personally found rufosynctus to be very uncommon in Oregon and we have found it to be very widely distributed with really not much in the way of um, any trends. And so um, in Western Canada, I'm used to finding rufosynctus everywhere. And to me, it's a, it's a very weedy species that's indicative of um, usually like pretty intensive landscape transformation at lower elevations, um, especially in grassland type areas. And so um, it's a really interesting scenario for me to come down to Oregon and now find this species that is so common in other places to be kind of uncommon and, and widespread. And so it may be that these trends are, are the same, just um, the landscape is, uh, is that much different. So we only have a couple left. Um, this is Bombus sitkensis. Um, the species was named after Sitka, Alaska. Um, you'll see that um, the notable characteristic for this species is that on the back of its thorax, the hairs are very, very dark. Thoroughly dark hairs in this region. So all through here, it's very dark. This bee does have a bit of a pale tail, um, like Bombus mixtus did, which had a very red tail in that example. Um, but Bombus sitkensis will typically have a very pale tail. And that could be salmon colored, it could be cream colored or um, pinkish. Um, this is our only bee that you'll find with um, pink hairs on it. So Bombus sitkensis likes, likes it 
cool and wet. And so we find it in two kinds of habitats. We find it in um, more coastal habitats, um, wet temperate habitats, like we find in Western Oregon here. And then we also find bomb sequences at elevation. And so um, you'll find it in high alpine areas where the alpine habitat is cool and wet. Um, and then also in coastal um, temperate habitats as well. And so our, our data follows that uh, known kind of trend of its uh, preferred ecosystem types. Bombus silvicola is a pretty cool species that um, you only really find at high elevations. And so this one um, has, you know, striking yellow, black, and orange, um, very contrasted colors. Has a similar color patterning to Bombus huntii, um, especially on the abdomen, which is yellow, orange, orange, yellow. Um, but this photo really does a good job of um, showing what this bee looks like. It has very, very long hair. And so sometimes Bombus silvicola can be super hard to identify, um, but in a lot of cases, it has very long hair. Um, and this is an exceptional uh, example of that. Um, in our specimens in Oregon, um, typically the hair is not as long as in this example. This example is um, from a specimen from Alaska. Um, but what you can see here on the midleg tibia is that the black hairs on the midleg um, tibia are very long black hairs. And so our bombus silvicola that are on the, in the high elevations on the east side of the Cascades and in the uh, Wallawas and in the Steens, um, their hairs will be a bit shorter like a hunty eye, but they'll have very, very long black hairs on other parts of their body. Um, which are distinctive. So we haven't found a lot of them. We found some over in the Wallawas and we found some in the Steens. And I do believe we have a couple data points um, up above sisters somewhere um, that aren't on this map. Three bumblebees left. So Bombus vagans is one of these half yellow and half black bumblebees. Um, it has a characteristic black dot on its thorax. And it has a very long face with a little kind of bump on its nose, right? You can almost make it out in this photo. But it has a bit of a bump right here. Um, Bombus vagans is a more of a boreal species and it goes coast to coast. Um, and so we, we have found it um, kind of in the Umatilla forest here. Um, this is at Lake Wallawa. So it's lower elevation and low elevation in the Wallawas. And then over here, I think in the John Day. And I do believe there's one or two records from um, al along the Columbia River Valley. And so it does seem, as far as we can tell so far, to be kind of isolated um, to these tributaries of the Columbia. Um, but time will tell. We're not finding very many of them, um, but they are um, somewhat locally common. So if you do find one, there's probably a bunch around. Um, but if you get into these areas here, you're, you're likely to come across some rufous inctus and some Bombus vagans. Now, Bombus van dyke is a kind of a rare bumblebee species, I would say. Um, certainly in large parts of uh, the continent, um, they're locally abundant, but not widespread. And so, again, when you find them, you'll find like a bunch of local populations. Um, where they're happy to live, but otherwise you won't find them broadly. So we find them in some pockets down in the Klamath Mountains and the Siskiyous down here. Um, we find them scattered on the east, primarily on the east side of the Cascades and the foothills, um, and then into some of these low um, dry forested areas in the Blue Mountain eco region. And then of course we have um, some populations kind of uh, from the Dalles um, down to Portland. Um, the color morph of Van Dyke that we have is actually um, like on the bottom right here. And so there's some weird color morphs of Bombus Van Dyke, um, Van Dyke's bumblebee. Um, but the one that we have is almost always um, like this template. Um, but this template is for a different bumblebee. And the difference is, is that Van Dyke's bumblebee has the yellow stripe, not on T4, but on T3, on the posterior half of T3, in fact. 
Last but not least, of course, we have Bombas Voznesensky. And I was thinking today, Voznesensky, this is um, a Russian name uh, for a bumblebee named by another Russian author. So is it Bombas Vosnes, Voznesensky I, or is it Bombas Voznesensky I? I don't know. I'm going to start saying Voznesensky I just, <laughs> just to drive people nuts, maybe. But this is our most um, common and abundant species, certainly. Um, it has a very yellow head, it has yellow shoulders, and of course T4 is yellow. This is um, a color pattern that's um, typical for six or seven of our, our bumblebee species in the state. And so we have found it, as you can see, from the eastern slopes of the Cascades west is like 95% of the records. Um, primarily in the valley, in the mountains, on the coast. Um, and then, of course, a couple records scattered um, in high tributaries of the snake, which is interesting. So this concludes our Bumblebee, uh, Oregon Bee Atlas Bumblebee Field Guide. Um, a few things to note are that there are some bumblebees known from the state historically that we have not detected. Um, through the Oregon Bee Atlas. Those are Bombus Franklini, which hasn't been found since maybe 2006, I think. Bombus Tericola, which might be a historically erroneous record. Bombus Bohemicus and Bombus Suclei, which are other cuckoo bumblebees. And of course, Bombus Pennsylvanicus. So that gives you a few um, other targets to, to go out and document in Oregon this coming field season. Now, I got to say a big thank you. Um, to our funding partners, um, and of course, Ray Temple, Stephanie Bazin, Missy Martin, um, and Jerry and Judah, who have been uh, very generous in helping support the Oregon Bee Atlas. Uh, so, let's take some questions. So if you do have questions, I see a lot of people in the chat, which I wasn't able to um, follow along with, but. If um, you have a question, please pop them into the Q&A box. And do you want someone to read them to you, Link, or do you want to? No, I'll, I'll moderate it. Sorry. All, right. All right. So from Scott Mitchell, who's a graduate student here at OSU um, and an expert naturalist, how much do you think the distributions of all these bumblebee species is driven by their physiology and temperature moisture tolerance versus host plant distributions and food requirements? Well, Scott, there is um, some research on this. And so all of these things are interconnected. So when I say, you know, wet, temperate ecosystems, well, that also uh, determines the plant communities that are there. Um, so I know that they've done um, a lot of cool plant studies um, in California. Um, and Another determining thing that isn't um, maybe considered quite as, as much is um, the nesting prerequisites for these species. They have very different nesting um, requirements, um, either above ground, on the ground, in the ground, in association with various um, bird nests, in association with various rodent nests. And so there's a lot more um, specificity to those things than I think is maybe um, documented. Um, but certainly we can see just from these very generalized um, distribution maps that um, they do have these kind of tight um, correlations to these attributes, whether you want to define them as physical attributes, you know, climate, plant communities, um, or, or so on, um, they're all interrelated. So let's see from Rebecca, in my Oregon Coast Garden, um, overwintering queens come out any winter day. Absolutely they do. If it's clear and it's sunny, they'll be poking around and you're gonna have flowers all year round too. Um, they, they nectar on heathers. So the question is, what would their natural food plants be at this time of year? I cannot find any blooming native plants within a quarter mile of my home. Um, well, you know, part of the answer is, is buried in the question in that 
so, so many so much of our landscape has been permanently and dramatically altered um you know it's easy to kind of um apply like an ethos to that and say it's all bad but in in some cases we're providing a lot of forage in areas where there wouldn't be forage naturally at various times of year and certainly in some circumstances i don't know if it's um, the case for the coast but in some situations um you know transformation can bolster the bee populations through irrigation and um, different other effects and so I'm not sure what they would be feeding on on the coast naturally. Um, you know, I, I don't know what time the uh, vicinium starts blooming. Um, and I've been out there in March and, you know, there's some forage in March, but like you say, there's not much. And certainly mid-January, um, not much to go on. So what are your thoughts about the potential impact of impatience in the Pacific Northwest? Um, there might be no impact. There might be a dramatic impact. You know, it's hard for me to say. Um, who knows what kind of viruses they're carrying in their populations. Um, we have impatience spreading through British Columbia. Um, we have detected impatience in uh, the Thompson River Valley. And so if it's not there, it'll be in the Okanagan in Canada soon. Um, and then of course there's there's a highway for it to follow straight into Washington State. And that's if it doesn't just come come along the coast, which is where the greater populations of impatience are to begin with. So yeah, I don't know what the impacts could be. Um, you know, we have our kind of paranoia about what they might be, which is um, microbial, you know, um, competition and, and all the different effects, but um, it's hard to say. They they might find that um, you know the interior is too dry for them. And too cold in the winter. Um, I just uh, 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 to point out, I'll put it in the links. But um, we had Chris Looney uh, from Washington State Department of oh, Agriculture perfect. talk about it um, on this episode of pollination. Perfect, great timing. But well, it is it is a, a current issue, that's for sure. So from Lisa and Wenatchee, uh, B. Rufo on T three read that they have upright hairs. There is that a useful ID trait? Short, short face too. Um, I don't know about that upright hair characteristic. Um, I think I maybe heard about that years ago, but it's not something I've ever looked at. But I can tell you that certainly on T2, it, they always have that yellow crescent and their malar area is extremely short. Um, and there's other, um, if you're really getting caught up on them, there's there's other characters you can use to I identify them to, um, the subgenus Kulu Manobombus first before you try and identify them to species. Um, from Kalika, what is the hair of bumblebees or bees in general made of? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you, I'm sorry. Let's see, from Lori, is there a clear association between the hair length and the temperature regimes that B is found in. Um, I'm not sure if there's research on this, uh, but I do think that there is. Um, three species that we commonly find in uh, alpine uh, tundra habitats in Canada are Bombus frigidus, um, Bombus silvicola, and Bombus curbialis, which is also called Bombus baltiatus. And all three of those high elevation species have very long hair. And uh, so it's just my opinion that they use it to keep warm because that's that seems intuitive but uh, i'm not familiar with the the literature on that specific issue um so let's see from uh, lisa b baggins shows up most late in the year at your house interesting so i wonder if it's coming out of the hills um and coming down in elevation seeking late season forage after the the hills dry up um, that would be interesting to see if you find them at higher elevations um, in June. Oh, Dr. Hammer asks, what does senso stricto mean? That's a good question. So it means specifically in the strict sense. And so for example, um, 
in my talk when I was uh, presenting about Bombus fervidus and Bombus californicus, Bombus fervidus, um, when it was originally described as a new species, they would have described the all yellow version. And then later on, we would have determined that Bombus californicus is actually a subspecies of Bombus fervidus. So Bombus californicus would actually be called Bombus fervidus subspecies californicus, which makes Bombus fervidus the big yellow one, Bombus fervidus fervidus, or Bombus fervidus in the strict sense, um, relating to that initial description. Let's see. Um, from Judy Maxwell, are any bumblebees floral specialists? If so, what are their floral preferences? That's a good question, but because bumblebees are social and act are mostly social and, and active all season, they need to utilize a variety of resources. So um, bumblebees do have um, preferences. There's no question. So if you see a big patch of um, introduced purple vetch, I bet you could go catch a Bombus appositus on it or a Bombus nevidensis. Those are long-faced, long-tongued bumblebees that love visiting some of those um, longer flowered fetches. Um, and so likewise, you know, some of our shorter-faced, shorter-tongued bumblebees, for example, Bombus occidentalis, they have a strong preference for thistles and goldenrod. Um, and so, although none of them are specialized, um, all of the bumblebee species have particular fondness for um, certain plants that are common um, in the, you know, in those ecosystems uh, that they live in. Let's see, how early is a good time to go out into the different desert areas? That's a good question. Um, I can't com comment specifically on all of them. And also, when you start talking about the extreme ends of the season, then it varies more and more by year. So um, you might have 25 Celsius weather on the second week of March, where you live some years, and other years, it's minus 10 Celsius. And so those shoulder seasons get a lot more extreme than um, mid-season. So um, personally, um, We'll see some really nice bees coming out in March. Um, a lot of early season Andrina. You know, like by the middle of March, some willows could be finished. And of course, you know, willows um, host a lot of cool spring species. So, um, you know, consider that in Desert Valley, the super bloom is, is only a few weeks away. So um, we're only a few weeks after that, if that's any help. And uh, Lisa says that Bee Impatience, um, the Eastern Bumblebee is now in Seattle. So it's coming down the coast. From David Jennings, Impatience are moving south quickly on the west side of Washington. One got detected close to Seattle. Yeah, there you go. So um, they're inbound. Well, uh, I won't say that we'll build a wall, but we'll build a wall of master melatologists with nets at, <laughs> at Astoria in Portland. Um, and Lisa says one uh, Bombus pennsylvanicus turned up in the Idaho Pacific Northwest bumblebee atlas this year. That's really cool. So, um, you know, that's one of those species um, that kind of, it's not found widely in the Pacific Northwest, but right, they do get detected from time to time. And so it's one of those things where, you know, they had this challenge when they were putting together the checklist of um, Montana bees is that they had all these eastern bumblebees where there's like one or two records that get into eastern Montana and it's like well it's not representative of the Montana fauna but it's been found there so um, so you know if we have people in the Snake River in the Waihe you know there's a chance um, people could detect um, Bombus pennsylvanicus in Oregon again as well um, let's see so if anyone has any more questions, um, just put them in the Q&A and, and we'll get to those shortly. So again, from uh, Mrs. Robinson in Wenatchee, have you noticed malar space is getting shorter? So the malar space is the bumblebee's cheek from its eye to its um, articulation of its tooth. 
And so are those areas getting shorter? Um, I, I don't think they're changing. I think they're shorter on, on some bees and longer on others. Um, let's see, is there any other questions in here? No, I think that's about it. So um, unless anyone has some more questions, let's see, we got three. No, these have all, oh, from um, Les Jones. I'm just a master gardener, no bee expert. And just wondering, do all bumblebees hive underground? That's a great question, Les. Um, no. Um, some bumblebees prefer to live above ground. Some bumblebees like to live on the ground. And some bumblebees like to nest underground. Um, the ones that nest above ground like to nest in above ground bird or rodent burrow or nests. Sorry. So above ground bumblebees like to nest in old bird nests or squirrel nests or in little holes in trees or wherever they can find. Um, bumblebees that like to nest on the, on the ground like to nest in deep grass thatch, often in rodent burrows, and bum some bumblebees prefer, as you notice, to, um, to live underground. So from Bonnie, are you expecting any new species to show up with climate change? Um, new species introductions and to where? Um, into Campbell River? Um, maybe, it's possible. Um, but keep in mind that uh, the cli climate likely doesn't change everywhere. Some places might get hotter, some places might get colder, some places get rainier, some places might get drier. So um, certainly there's going to be change. from Sharon Gray, what is the disease or problem that's heading our way? Um, <laughs> I wish I could just take liberties with that one. Um, well, I think what people were mentioning earlier is that the, the Eastern bumblebee has been introduced into Vancouver or into the lower mainland of British Columbia uh, many years ago, and it's, its range has been expanding. So I think that's the topic that people were on. And so that eastern bumblebee is on the coast and it's been found in Seattle and it's, you know, more than likely spreading where it can um, into places that it likes. Um, and so I guess the fear is that, um, you know, bumblebees do harbor a lot of um, viruses um, and Mic uh, microorganisms. And so it's a possibility, of course, and that um, an introduced bumblebee could spread diseases into um, the wild bumblebee populations. And that's been an ongoing hypothesis about um, why some bumblebees appear to be declining. So from Kalika, have you mainly focused on the genus Bombus in your taxonomic research? Um, no. Um, I've done quite a bit of work on, on Bombus. Uh, I don't know how many bumblebees I've identified in my life, probably like 200,000 or something. <laughs> well, I'll just say half as many as John Asher. And, uh, but um, I'm, I'm interested in, in faunas and in floral relations. And so that kind of allows me to look at all of the species. And I've um, done lots of molecular work and we'll be doing more molecular work um, shortly here at Oregon State with the Oregon Bee Atlas. Um, we'll be sequencing several hundred of our bee specimens um, to help us um, better determine what species they are or if they're new species or what. Um, and so, yeah, I'm interested in, in lots of different bees, um, not just bumblebees. But I thought bumblebees was a good option for this talk um, because we do have a lot of the data available. Um, Let's see, in or oh, bees in Oregon that are moving north from Bonnie. Um, I, I'm, I wouldn't, you know, if I was in if I was in southern British Columbia, I wouldn't be too worried about um, southern bees moving north. Um, let's see, from David Jennings, a study from Colorado high alpine area. They found that over the past forty years, along the tongue lengths were getting shorter. Um, attributed in part to floral changes in availability. Yeah, I have have been watching the research out of um, the institute there. 
Uh, but I can't really comment on that too much. And we're out of questions again. So unless you folks fire a couple in there in the next few seconds, um, there we go. Karen, this is a good question. What is the impact of collecting specimens, especially upon rare species? So um, all of the data, I, there's a lot of dots on those maps, right? So it, that could be cause for concern. So all of this data was collected by our trained um, field techs, you know, all of our master melatologist um, apprentices, all of our B Atlas surveyors. Um, and so what they do is they go out, they find a flowering plant, they take a photo of it, which goes on iNaturalist, that serves as the plant host record for the bees they catch. And then they catch some bees off that flowering plant. Um, so as you can see, and I didn't say the numbers earlier, but um, in the data that was presented this evening, um, the red dots, which is data from 2018 was, excuse me, it was around 1500 specimens. So 1,500. And the data from 2019 represented around 3,500 records. So all of those, those dots represented about 5,000 um, bee specimens. And so the impact on rare species is low. And the reason for that is, um, if you recall, um, the species that were common, the map is covered in dots. Everywhere we go, we find it, we catch one and document it. Um, but for some of those rare species, like Bombus morsoni, Bombus occidentalis, even more rare in the state, Bombus vagans, um, and some others, um, for those, you know, we have 175 people out catching bees. They don't even find any. And so what happens is, is the impact on species is disproportionately on the most common species because we end up catching lots of the common species and very, very few of the rare species. And so the impact is perfectly skewed um, in correlation with how common or rare they are. Um, that's, that's all I have to say about that. So we're out of questions. And so we'll call it a night. Um, let's close this Q and A box. And so thank you for everyone for coming. Um, I think when you log out, you'll find that there is a survey asking what you'd like to hear more of. Um, now, if you're interested in becoming a certified master melatologist and joining the Oregon Bee Atlas, please do. If you just Google master melatologist, you don't even have to spell it right. The first hit will take you to this page where you can as you can see here, add your name to the waiting list. Um, now this year in 2021, we will be admitting some individuals from California, Idaho, Washington, and British Columbia. And so you won't be able to um, send us your, your bees to be identified, but you will be able to access all of our online training. And so we're developing more and more online training modules and educational modules and so if you would add your name to our waiting list and tell us where you're from, um, you can help us expand this program to other states. And you know maybe um, each state can have their own master melatologist program, just like master gardeners. So don't hesitate. Now, as you know, programs like this um, are primarily funded by grants, um, which makes their existence tenuous. And so donations, um, go a long, long ways to bring <clears throat> to bringing our program stability and longevity. So, if you follow the, uh, if you go to our website, you'll find the the donation uh, link. Um, we accept donations of any size. We'll take your loonies, your toonies, or your greenbacks. We don't care. And of course, if you're interested in um, pr providing an endowment, we would love that. Um, and I, so just contact us. I just want to mention something that happened recently. Uh, Gene Natter uh, helped. We had a specific need to do mm. some, some DNA barcoding and Gene uh, stepped up. Thank you so much, Gene, for um, uh, allowing us. So those, those kinds of donations can be put to very specific projects. So we really appreciate that support. 
That's right. And I'll, I'll tell what, you know, um, so Gene provided the funding and what we're going to do is we're going to barcode um, a few hundred um, Lazioglossum, Lazioglossum sweat bee specimens. And that'll allow us to develop a molecular reference collection for sweat bees in the state. Um, and, you know, there could be like 90 species of Lazioglossum in Oregon or something ridiculous. And certainly there are many new undescribed species to be discovered in, in Oregon. Um, we already know that there's a whole bunch. And so it's those sorts of donations that allow us to continue making these really cool discoveries and do all this education outreach. So thanks for coming, everyone. And we'll see you next month. Good night.